Okay. Perfect. Uh, it's recording. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kiki. All right. Thank you, Kiki, directly from Brazil. And good morning to our friends from all over the world joining us today in this special Sunday where we get together uh, as a spiritual family to educate our souls, to be in touch with each other, and to evolve as eternal souls that we are. But before we start our, uh, our services today, I would like to invite our dear sister Regina, who will set the tone of this meeting by saying a beautiful opening prayer for us. Thank you, dear Regina. Thank you. Let us close our eyes. Let us open our inner eye and our divine heart to our Heavenly Father. And let us first say, hello, Heavenly Father. And let us give thanks for this blessed opportunity to be together in peace and in harmony. And we thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank all the wonderful beings who have blessed us with their love and their care and their prayers to allow us to have a peace of heart this morning to be together. We thank you, Father, for all our teachers and our guides. As you know, this is a journey we are all on. May we all open our hearts and our minds for the lesson today. May you bless us, Father, to understand what this lesson is about and what is good for us to walk away with, to marinate on. And may we always, always have you as our guide and our teacher in love and peace. And we ask you, dear Father, to bless the opening of this service today in your name and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, so be it. So it is. So be it, so it is. Thank you, dear Regina. Thank you, friends. One more time for being here today, contributing with your energy and your presence. Uh, welcome to Bezeha Spiritual Healing. We are here online and we are all over the world coming together uh, for the study of the spiritism. Uh, for those who don't know about uh, Bezeha Spiritual Healing Center, we are a non-denomination organization. In other words, we invite all religions, everyone from all over the world and different uh, walks of life to join us in our daily uh, meditation and services and activities that we have, classes, as well as on our Sunday. Every Sunday, we are here together at 10 a.m. PST here in California uh, to study more about the spiritism, the uh, codification of the spiritism by Allan Kardec, and other uh, topics related to spiritism. The idea is to educate ourselves so we understand uh, how to live in harmony uh, with discarnate and incarnated, and really understand our mission here as eternal uh, you know, workers of light here on earth. So you are invited to join us from anywhere in the world to be part of our uh, services. And in fact, we have uh, classes that we offer and you can see the details on our website. Uh, and we are happy to share with you uh, via our newsletter uh, that we send every week telling you more about the service that we offer. But I'll give you an example. And the highlight is that every day there, except for Sunday, we have a daily prayer at 6 p.m. Pacific time. So if you would like to join us, join forces, even if you're not able to log in on Zoom, uh, we ask that you stay in, in peace, stay in silence and connect with us through the daily prayer every day, except on Sunday uh, at 6 p.m. PST. Uh, we are joining forces and thoughts and energy to, to pray for our country, for people, uh, for people in need, most importantly, right? And then for every day of the week, we have a specific opportunity for you guys to join us. So, for example, Tuesday, well, we have Light Ahead at Divine Light. So at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, we have an activity that you may want to join us. 
um, on Wednesday, we also have the fraternal counseling. If you are going through any tribulations and would like a friend, you know, a, a shoulder, a person to speak about, uh, you can also contact us for that service. It's from 4 to 7 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday. And the inner transformation uh, study, it starts at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday. On Thursday at 6.30 p.m., we have the psychology of gratitude. And then on Sunday, as I said today, at 10 a.m., we start the, now we have a, a speech, which we are going to be introducing shortly, our guest speaker for today, as well as the healing passes, which is our second part of the, the session here. And then in the evening at 5.30 p.m. Pacific, we have the Workers of the Life Eternal, which is a book study uh, by the Divine Light uh, study group. In other words, friends, there are opportunities to learn in many ways, in many formats. So that's the goal, to educate ourselves, right? To enlighten our soul and our mind with good thoughts, to elevate our frequency, to always vibrate for the love, for the good, for the peace. And that's one of our tasks here as uh, eternal uh, souls here on earth. Um, so join us. Uh, we also have a, a website, bshcenter.org, where you can learn more about spiritism, the kind of uh, prayers that, uh, that are available for you in different occasions, uh, our services, and much, much more. So please do use the, the resources, the tools that we offer uh, to all of you. And without further ado, my friends, it's a special Sunday. We are so, so happy and so grateful to welcome back Peter Hayes. He's our dear friend, uh, has uh, spoken here um, for our friends here at Bezeha Spiritual Healing. And Peter, you wanna know this, he is a worker at the Spiritist Group Love and light in Newark, New Jersey, where he has been an active member for over years. He is a regular participant in the Tri-State Spiritism Federation. And in 2021, he joined the board of directors of the United States Spiritism Federation, which we are part of. He has done lectures in English about the spiritism within the United States and has participated in the several U.S. Spiritism Symposiums. Peter loves to play guitar, very nice, and teaches at Spiritist Group Love and Light, which has led to regular visits to a New Jersey nursing home to perform music. Beautiful healing through music. He has a long background in theater as a playwright, a literary manager, electrician and a carpenter, a man of many skills, Peter. <laughs> and Peter has published several children's books with his wife, Brazilian author Betty, through their company, Saint Fronteiras Press, no borders, né? with publishers in Brazil and Colombia. Wow, wonderful to hear more about you, Peter. And welcome, my friend, to Abyssin Spiritual Healing. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us today. And I and all of us are so excited, and looking forward to learn more about the law of progress in America. So without further ado, my friends, help me to welcome warmly our dear Peter. Thank you so much, Peter. The stage is yours, my friend. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, everyone at BSH. It is a pleasure to be here. I uh, was interested in um, this subject, the law of progress in America. And there are a couple of questions that are in part three of the Spirit's book, which focus on the divine laws that come from God. And in the section on the law of progress, chapter eight, there are two questions in particular that I wanna focus on. And the first one is question 788 which is nations are collective individualities that pass through the phases of infancy, maturity, and decline, just as individuals do. Does this truth, as proven by history, imply that the most advanced nations of this century will ultimately experience their decline and end, just like those of antiquity? 
So this presentation is taking a look at, or this question is taking a look at question uh, of, of nations in general. Uh, but uh, this question also is kind of equating uh, a nation to a person in a way, as if there's a kind of collective spirit of a nation. And does a, will the nations today inevitably go into some kind of decline? Well, the answer is interesting because the answer shortly is it depends. It says that nations that only live a material life and whose greatness is based on force and territorial expansion are born, grow, and die because the strength of a nation eventually becomes exhausted like that of an individual. Nations whose selfish laws are opposed to the progress of enlightenment and charity die because light kills darkness and charity kills selfishness. That being said, nations and individuals also have a spiritual life, and those whose laws are in harmony with God's eternal laws will continue to live and serve as a beacon for other nations. So again, it depends a lot on what the focus of a nation is, collectively speaking. But it's interesting that this question is framed as if a nation were an individual. Can a nation be like an individual in some way? Well, we're going to spend a little time on that. But there's also question 793, much shorter question. What are the signs of a fully developed civilization? And the answer is you recognize it by its moral development. You think you are advanced because you have made great discoveries and brilliant inventions and because you are better sheltered and clothed than savages. I have to give there's that language from that era. However, you will only truly have the right to call yourself civilized when you have eradicated vices from your society and when you live as brothers and sisters practicing Christian charity. Until then, you are merely enlightened nations that have only passed through the first phase of civilization. So again, the focus here is more on civilizations. It goes on to say, civilization has its degrees like everything else. A civilization in transition is an incomplete civilization. It produces distinct evils unknown in the primitive state. Still, it constitutes a natural and necessary progress that remedies the problems it causes. As civilization is perfected, it ends some of the problems it causes, and these troubles vanish completely with moral progress. Notice there is an emphasis here on moral progress, and I'll say more about this in a little bit, but there's also a theme in this answer about how once a civilization gets started, once the nation gets started and it develops, then a whole new set of problems come in that were not there before. But what do we mean when we say civilization? Well, here's an, a, a, a definition. An advanced state of intellectual, cultural, and material development in human society, marked by progress in the arts and sciences, the extensive use of record keeping, including writing, and appearance of complex political and social institutions. So the focus of this presentation is on the United States. The United States, a civilization based upon this definition, the answer, the short answer is yes, of course. It certainly has. Um, arts and sciences. Um, there is obviously an extensive use of record keeping and we have rather complex political and social institutions. So we are certainly a civilization. Um, how progressed we are is, is another matter altogether. Let's continue with the answer to question 793. The most advanced nation from any two that have reached the top of the social ladder is the one with the least amount of selfishness, greed, and pride. The one whose habits are morally better, more intellectual than material, and where intelligence can develop freely. It is the one with the greatest amount of kindness, good faith, compassion, and generosity. It is where prejudices of class and birth are not rooted because they are incompatible with true love for one's neighbor. And then this question starts to wrap up. Its laws do not allow privileges and are the same for every member of its society. 
It is where human beings' beliefs, hum, sorry, it is where human life beliefs, opinions are respected, and where is the smallest number of poor and unhappy individuals. Finally, it is a nation where people who are willing to work are guaranteed the essentials for survival. I think this question is fascinating because look at all of the standards that it introduces in just a few short paragraphs. So the question, a few questions. Is the United States of America reasonably free of, quote, selfishness, greed, and pride? Another question. How much do we live a material life and focus on territorial expansion? How about does the USA have a collective spiritual life? If so, what is it? How much does this country practice, quote, Christian charity or any charity? Meaning one is not Christian. And what is that? <laughs> Finally, have we truly accepted equality because we know that quote, prejudices of class and birth are not rooted because they are incompatible with true love for our neighbors. These are just a few questions. And I should mention that in a presentation like this, especially with only about 40 minutes or so, it is impossible to cover everything one might possibly say about the state of this nation. That would probably take weeks. But what I'm gonna do today is just raise a few questions. I'll try to answer them partially but there are certainly other questions that one could ask and other ways to answer these questions. But um, before we get to, and I'll return to these questions later, but first let's focus on some of the profound changes that have occurred. Keep in mind, this country is only about 240 years old. That's based on when this country gained its independence. I'll say a little bit more about this area of our history soon. I'm not going to focus on the very rich and complex history that existed in this country prior to the Declaration of Independence in 1776. So just focusing on the last 240 years or so. And here are some of the profound changes. Big and obvious one, the Industrial Revolution transformed the world. When this country began, it was an agricultural society. The Industrial Revolution started in about the 1820s or so. That's when it really got going into the 1830s. And that had pro very profound changes, not only on this country, but on the, the world as a whole. There are lots of things one could say about how the Industrial Revolution transformed things, but it certainly had, um, you know, this country was largely uh, very heavily relied on agriculture up until, well, really World War II. I mean, for those of you in California, California was largely an agricultural state before World War II, but afterwards it transformed enormously. A subject my grandfather was very interested in. My grandfather was very involved in California, but that's another subject. There have been a numerous and huge advances in science that have certainly transformed progress overall. It is a lot of intellectual progress. It is the way in which we live today has no comparison to the way that our founding fathers lived, for example. There are improvements in technology. It's been argued that technology as it increases also has a positive effect on democracy. One could maybe debate that subject a little bit, but the idea is that the more technology advances, the more information flows freely, the more it can have a, a generally speaking, a democratic effect. Can technology be used to spy on people? Yes, of course, it can be used to manipulate people. But as a general comment, whether we're talking about science or technology and so forth, the industrial revolution, all of these are tools and the question one could ask is, how are we using these tools? Are we using them as tools or are they these tools using us? What about other areas like the rights of women and people of color and sexual orientation? Certainly, this country has seen a lot of change. There's a lot more that needs to be done. Uh, but um, we're experiencing a mix of tensions in terms of 
both gender at, uh, gender issues as well as as sex orientation and certainly racial issues. But look at where this country was even just a couple of decades ago or even four decades ago, five, six, seven decades ago. There's been a lot of change. Again, this is very much one of those areas where we're in a period of, of transition and it remains to be seen what will happen. Again, this is a, a complex subject in which there's a lot of um, progress, yes, but there's also a lot of things that have occurred that one can find very alarming. What about our relationship to war and peace? Well, what does that mean? Well, because of technology, uh, really in the 20th century, a couple of things happened, generally speaking. World War I, for instance, led to a lot of casualties because they were fighting a 19th century style war with 20th century weapons. And then in World War II, weapons of course got more sophisticated and we had the atomic bomb. Um, and since then, we have gone through the nuclear arms race and we're still dealing with that. But the point is this, because we now have weapons that are capable of far greater destruction than before, it has certainly made us think more about what it means to have peace. Is the world relatively more peaceful now than it used to be? Well, in many ways, you could say it is, yes, despite what's going on in the Ukraine right now and elsewhere. But there was a time in Europe, for instance, and elsewhere where countries invaded each other constantly. It was very frequent. And nowadays, with the threat of massive uh, weapons of destruction, it does make leaders think twice. Now, this is, I would say, rather dubious progress. Um, and one has to tread very carefully in this area because so far we have not uh, engaged in destruction that was just so beyond that that it, it destroys whole cities and countries. But that said, obviously there's been a lot of destruction that has occurred places like Ukraine, of course. I know people who are from the Ukraine, so I'm quite aware of what's been going on there. Um, what about in this country, more tolerance of religious backgrounds? Yes, in general, uh, there certainly has been. Um, Should be. One example that one could, could point out, for instance, is that um, when John F. Kennedy was elected president in 1960, that was a big deal because he was the first Catholic to be elected president. Before then, there was a very strong sort of Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, tone in this country. And um, people had this attitude that uh, if, if John F. Kennedy were elected president, well, he would only really be allegiance, swear allegiance to the Pope, he wouldn't swear allegiance to this country and so forth. Well, attitudes like that now seem uh, really out of place. And I think it's safe to say, although there is certainly religious bigotry in this country, a lot of people don't feel this way in that regard. There is, generally speaking, more tolerance of religious background. And what about intellectual freedom? Well, um, we certainly have uh, free will in this country and that we're allowed to apply what we want to pursue um, without any real restrictions per se. I'm quite aware of the fact that there are in certain parts of the country book banning and things like that. But the way this country was set up, and I'll say more about this later, we have the freedom to pursue intellectual subjects that we're interested in without the risk of going to jail for it. That was not always a given. Uh, and many, and still in this day and age, in other parts of the world, there are places where you simply can't express your opinions openly without running the risk of getting into a lot of trouble. Now, with this intellectual freedom, of course, is free will. And many people may choose not to pursue intellectual freedom. They may choose to just sort of pursue subjects and issues that are rather banal. 
but at least we have the freedom to develop our intellect. There are, of course, some big challenges that our, this country is facing, and not just this country. There is the growing inequality of rich and poor. In just the last 40 years, in the early 1980s, one of the things that started to happen was a weakening of antitrust laws, which allowed companies to buy each other up like mad and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And there are a lot of concern about the effect of inequality between rich and poor. Again, this is another complex subject that could be a, any of these could be a lecture under themselves. But in this case, people are worried about the growing influence of, of corporate power. It's been around for a long time. It's actually nothing really new in many ways. It's, it's something that has been a part of this country uh, for quite a while, well, well, pretty much from the beginning. Uh, but it's more pronounced nowadays than before, and this is having its effect on people socially. Uh, part one of those effects is that there are some who are losing faith uh, in our institutions to address economic and social problems. There are people who feel helpless, people who feel like they are not able to really get ahead. Some people feel that the American dream is dead. But one could ask the next question, what is really meant by the American dream? The American dream, when people think of the American dream, they think about economic prosperity, that maybe you start poor and you wind up rich, uh, that you're able to somehow improve your lot and move from one class to another and that sort of thing. But the American dream is more than that. The American dream is also about spiritual fulfillment about self-actualization. And I will say more about that in a few minutes. But that is, so when people lose faith in our institutions to address economic social problems, there is maybe a feeling of powerlessness. Um, and that can be a, a real feeling. But the other question also is, what can we realistically expect some of our institutions to solve? Some lack respect for one another and for the rule of law. There is at times a feeling, again, because people feel like our institutions are ineffective or people don't trust our institutions, that they have to maybe take matters into their own hands. Again, this is one of those threads in this country's history that goes back quite a ways. There's nothing particularly new about that. It's like there are elements in this country that, that feel that this is um, that it's better to do this. It's been said um, that rudeness is on the increase in general among people. If that is true, then it could strongly suggest, among other things, anxiety. But also, it can suggest that maybe there are many who feel like consequences don't really exist. There's almost an attitude that the rules that apply to everybody else don't really apply to me. If that is, and that can suggest anxiety, it can suggest um, a, an indifference. It's almost a type of sociopathic, even in some cases, psychopathic type behavior. But it is a general feeling that whatever I do, it doesn't really matter all that much. Again, many people, I think, feel this feeling of powerlessness. Another big issue, of course, is serious environmental issues. Again, this is another complex subject, but this country, um, it has been said, has certainly played a key role in global warming among, as one example, um, that may be disputed by some, but many of the world's scientists certainly believe that global warming is real. And this country's economic activity has been enormous. And I think many feel very strongly that we have played a very big role in causing some of these problems. And this is just one of many examples of that comment from question 788 uh, about nations, that as a nation begins to develop, it goes from a more primitive state to a more advanced state, a whole new set of problems occur. 
So when we talk about the Industrial Revolution, among other things, and, and moving into the more modern economy that we're in now, uh, there has been a lot of environmental consequences as a result of this. And again, I'm not here to make a political statement one way or the other. I'm just trying to, to point out that these are some of the issues that are faced regardless of what one's political beliefs might be. Now, how does one address some of these questions? Well, I'd like to spend a few minutes and go back to the beginnings of the United States of America. As I'm sure you all know, uh, 1776 was the year we declared our independence. The Declaration of Independence was largely written by Thomas Jefferson, very influenced by the Age of Enlightenment. Um, one of the people who also had a great impact on the thinking of the time in terms of motivating people to succeed from Great Britain was Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine wrote a book called Common Sense, and he just hammered away at monarchy and the premise of monarchy because the world, well, Europe especially, was largely ruled by divine right monarchy and the idea that power was inherited. And, uh, and, this, and yet the Age of Enlightenment developed and it started to question the power not only of the monarchy, but of the church as a whole. Uh, of course, the church was very powerful leading up to this era uh, from the 1600s going back. And um, the Declaration of Independence is emphasizing not only that all people are created equal, but that it's a natural right. It is part of the law of nature that people have equality. I'm quite aware of the fact that the Declaration says all men are created equal. They did not mention women. They, of course, did not mention people of color. We had slavery at this time. Um, but if you look at the intent of the architecture, the architecture was set up in such a way that it was possible for these things to, uh, to change as the country would develop. But the Declaration of Independence was a new direction in terms of the way a country can be constructed. I'd like to share with you a book that I really enjoy. But before I get to it, I will mention a couple of other things. Um, the, so we won our independence from Great Britain in 1783. And it wasn't until 1789 that we had the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States is a remarkable document for a few reasons, but one of them is that it's amazing we have a Constitution at all. It was understood that the country, when it first gained its independence, simply couldn't function. There just were too many things that were not uh, worked out, and so there was a lot of logistical problems. But our founding fathers disagreed with each other profoundly. They just... Uh, there, the whole states' rights versus federal rights issue that we see today, that was there pretty much from the very beginning, generally speaking. Um, it is, again, remarkable that despite the two years of wrangling that went on to create the Constitution, that eventually um, there came a point where the Founding Fathers came up with a document that people were willing to support but it was by no means certain. Now, there is a book called The American Soul by Jacob Needleman, and I'd like to share with you some information out of this book. He is a philosopher, uh, has a religious background, teaches at San Francisco State. And he um, mentions a few things about the nature of how this country was put together and what its premise is. And he says, to be American was an idea, not an escapable or in a, not an escapable organic given. America is a nation formed by the philosophical ideas that have been thought through by human beings. It is the only nation in the world that is so constituted. America is not a tribal, ethnic, or racial identity. It is a philosophical identity composed of ideas of freedom, liberty, independent thought, independent conscience, self-reliance, hard work, justice. 
So this country is more about a philosophical identity. It's not defined by its ethnic makeup. America is an incredibly diverse nation of peoples, people from all over the world, a variety of backgrounds, again, both religious, ethnic, cultural backgrounds. Um, and the, this country was unique in forming itself that way. He goes on to say that this idea that we're based on a philosophical idea is both a weakness and the strength of America. After all, one could say, what roots does this country have? What, what sort of roots do we really, what really holds us together? And he says, to love America is not to love one's roots. It is to love the flower that has not yet been blossomed. The fruit is yet unripened. To love America is to love the future, and perhaps it is this that sets the love America apart from what men and women of other nations feel about their native land. So part of understanding this country, part of loving America, if you will, is that we have to understand that we're a work in progress. If we judge ourselves based upon where we are at the moment and figure that's it, then yes, we're going to be very discouraged. But America is very much about our actions today will have an outcome on our future tomorrow. I'm not suggesting many people are aware of this. Some are, some aren't. Isn't this, a, the, however, a lot like spiritism? Spiritism strongly emphasizes that we are always planting seeds. The teachings of Jesus talk about this, where what we do today will have a bearing on where we're going to be tomorrow. Well, this country is put together with that idea in mind, unless some of the challenges I mentioned before stop it. Suppose wealth and inequality turns into autocratic behavior. Suppose those at the top will do anything to keep those at the bottom in their place, as it were. Well, if that sort of thing really happens full-fledged, then this type of um, foundation for this country is truly under threat. And of course, people are worried about this. Yes. Um, but... Uh, a general point, though, is that genuine liberty is merely is not merely an external pursuit via material success. When I talked before about the American dream, is the American dream dead? Mm -hmm. Well, generally speaking, if people are very attached to material success, then that's it's not wrong to engage in material matters. We are in the physical world, after all. Our economic system is a tool. The pursuit of wealth, as pointed out in the Gospel according to Spiritism, has its purpose. We learn a lot from making money, but it's just a tool, and, and our relationship with money is very complex. Where we get into trouble is if we worship money as if that's the only way to define our self-worth. If we only define our self-worth by how much money we have in the bank, what kind of what we do for a living, what our social status is, then we're liable to be very discouraged. And of course, some people do. But part of having liberty to begin with at all is that personal liberty is also an inward journey towards spiritual enlightenment. And this book, among others, American Soul, makes this point. This is what this country is also about. It's not just about the economic progress at all. And it would appear that maybe many have lost sight of that a little bit. After all, our economy is a tool. It is not meant to define completely our self-worth. So personal liberty, again, is an inward journey towards spiritual enlightenment. Um, I am going to try to summarize this a little quickly because of, of time. But um, there's a lot of text here, and I'm not going to read it all. There was, uh, to kind of illustrate or elaborate on this idea a little bit, there was a big rivalry between Thomas Jefferson um, and Alexander Hamilton. Uh, Jefferson, of course, was our third president. Alexander Hamilton was very influential in the creation of the Federalist Papers, Hamilton had a big impact on setting up the beginnings of America's banking system. 
And there was one debate in particular between Jefferson and Hamilton. Again, they were rivals, uh, generally speaking, for years. Um, after the Constitution was formed in 1789, the Constitution set up a lot of protections against the abuse of power and against autocratic governments. That was what our founding fathers were very worried about. Jefferson felt we need to spell this out. We need a Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights basically guarantee freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom to um, uh, have um, not to have our rights encroached upon. Hamilton argued, Hamilton said, look, that's already in the Constitution. Why do we need a Bill of, of Rights? Hamilton thought that the Bill of Rights was redundant. But there was an implication to this debate that Jacob Needleman in American Soul touches on. He talks about the rights of man. That's a reference to Thomas Paine, who wrote a book called The Rights of Man. Uh, again, Paine was very critical of the, he was a British journalist, and he was very critical of the monarchy. Uh, believed very much in individual liberties. And George Washington credited Thomas Paine for helping to inspire the colonists to support the Declaration of Independence. And also once that started and the war started, people lost faith rather quickly and Thomas Paine helped with that. But Jacob Needleman is emphasizing that the point of the idea of rights of man, which emerged so powerfully from the Enlightenment and through the mind of Jefferson, among others, is not simply and solely a negative concept. In other words, it wasn't just about, we got to protect ourselves from, from the government or from the abuses of power. Human rights for Jefferson does not mean solely the right not to be interfered with by government. This is only part of it. And of course, this is the part that commands so much attention in our present world. What he goes on to say is that when Jefferson was thinking about the rights of man, Jefferson was interested in, as it says here, the right to pursue one's authentic obligations as a God-created and potentially God-like human being through the latent power of divine reason or conscience within oneself. Does that sound a little similar to spiritism? There's some interesting overtones, I think to this, that Jefferson felt that, yes, we need to protect ourselves against the abuses of power. Jefferson and Hamilton agreed on that. They had no problem with that concern. They both were on board for that. But Jefferson wanted to take it further. He was arguing that human rights means we should be able to develop spiritually and intellectually in the most fullest way possible. So. The founding of America thus reads out as an attempt to create a form of government within which human society can function as a morally and spiritually educated force. What did question 788 and question 793 from the Spirit's book emphasize? The progress, the key to progress is moral progress. And part of what happened in the setting up of this country was that it allows for that to occur. It is part of the underlying premise of this country, even if that has been lost a little bit, maybe a lot. So, but Hamilton, um, as Needleman talks about Hamilton, he's not saying Hamilton's some materialist bad guy just because he was concerned about setting up a banking system, which led to the beginnings of the modern economy when the Industrial Revolution happened not long after uh, the time of Jefferson and Hamilton's debate over the Bill of Rights the banking system was in place that began to allow for this. But you see, Thomas Jefferson was horrified by money. Thomas Jefferson felt that the United States should be founded on agriculture. That's where it is. But there's an interesting point about um, uh, this because he's saying that Hamilton was focusing on external matters. He was not concerned with the inner life, so to speak. Uh, and you could say that was part of his strength. So again, Needleman is not saying Hamilton was wrong. He was just saying that Jefferson tried to take it a little bit further because Jefferson and Hamilton didn't seem to understand, or Hamilton maybe didn't fully understand where Jefferson was coming from, that um, uh, Jefferson was trying to um, 
he wanted a mixture of outer and inner considerations that dealing with both external liberty and internal moral development. So that was why he was insisting on the Bill of Rights. And the other thing that Jefferson was emphasizing is that um, he, Jefferson saw the pursuit of our moral progress, our spiritual progress, as being more in harmony with the forces of nature, that this was how nature itself worked. So part of the intention in the creation of this country was to kind of have these, well, we know about checks and balances, but that we were all, you know, there was checks and balances against the abuses of power, but it's kind of like a mechanism in which there's force and counterforce resembling the way that nature worked. But Jefferson also wanted to um, emphasize the importance of having both a communal life and individual effort so that we're both part of a community, but we should be allowed to develop ourselves and develop our potential. And some of the areas that Jefferson felt was important to develop was certainly freedom for intellectual uh, pursuit, free access to knowledge contained in books gained through untrammeled scientific experiment. Jefferson was a little critical of religion, I think dogmatic religion in particular, but he was obviously interested in spiritual progress. He felt it was, in, and, and this is very important, he felt it was very important that um, that everyone is allowed to have the right, they have the rights to their opinion and their place in the social order. So even if he disagreed with someone, he strongly supported the right for that person to have an opposing opinion, uh, because that was not always a given, especially in monarchies and other types of societies that are more autocratic. And then finally, he talks about the development of the physical organic substrate of human nature through a life in direct contact with the earth and its rhythms, its demands, its bounty, and its severity, namely a life rooted in agriculture. Now here, Jefferson is maybe was going to prove to be a little out of touch as he got older. And as he got later, as he uh, later in life, I think he realized that Hamilton essentially won the argument about the need to have a banking system, the need to have money, because what Hamilton was advocating was really progress that was going to take this country into the next era, which would eventually take us further and further away from agriculture. So um, I have to wrap up. I realize I'm nearly out of time. But um, is this country reasonably free of greed, selfishness, greed, and pride? We're on the fence. Uh, in some ways, we are better, but we still suffer from these, all of this. Um, and so we, when we talk about moral progress, we need to work on it. Uh, what about a material life? Well, many Americans are very religious and very spiritual in many ways. So to say that we only care about material life is not fair. Do we have, do we engage in territorial expansion? Again, long, complex subject, but our influence around the world is enormous, and we have certainly interfered in the affairs of other countries. So it remains to be seen what the long-term effects of that are really going to be. Do we have a collective spiritual life? Well, we may not all be agreement about that, but again, spirituality is important. When we talk about a collective spiritual life, there's a great number of, of uh, ways one could go with that. How much do we practice Christian charity or any type of charity? Well, Americans can be very generous toward one another. There is, of course, times when we're very selfish and self-centered. Uh, this country can be have a lot of pride. Uh, there, it can be very self-righteous uh, at times. Uh, and so as we understand charity is more of an emotional, um, as we understand that charity is more of an emotional charity rather than just material charity, then you know, there are many ways in which this does get practice. And as far as, uh, I touched on this a little bit already, but um, have we uh, really freed ourselves of prejudice of class and birth? Well, no, uh, obviously we haven't. It's still, the rooting, there's, it's very rooted in this country, this prejudice and racism, but it's in some ways getting uprooted bit by bit. But this is 
something that's going to take a while longer. One encouraging sign perhaps is that it appears that the younger generation in many ways is more tolerant of different religious, social, uh, ethnic backgrounds than perhaps older generations in America, Americans have been. I'm gonna wrap up very, very quickly and just make one last quick point because I know I'm out of time. Um, I mentioned this last part in Jefferson's home, Monticello. Um, there are two statues, one of Jefferson and one of Hamilton. And the author, Jacob Needleman of that book, American Soul, went to visit Monticello, which you can do. And he was surprised to see these two statues there. He figured, well, you know, somebody was taking care of this home, put these two statues there. It's kind of cute, isn't it? But what he was surprised to find out is that Jefferson himself put the statue of himself with him on one side and, and Alexander Hamilton on the other. And there was a visitor in Jefferson's time who was looking at these statues and didn't understand. And he you know, didn't get it, but Jefferson's comment was interesting. Jefferson said, opposed in death as in life. Now that might be understood in a few different ways, but I think what is interesting here is that Jefferson seemed to be saying, this man, Alexander Hamilton, and I profoundly disagreed with each other. He probably, you know, he got on my nerves. I think it's safe to say they probably infuriated each other. But he, they, he respected the right for them to have different opinions. One of the foundations of this country is that it is a given that we're not going to agree. Obviously, this country is very divided in many ways. But do we respect one another in spite of our differences? Do we see one another as brothers and sisters, even when we're radically opposed to each other? Well, that's one of the things that is essential in terms of the future of this country, because if we lose sight of that, and again, this was one of those creeds that was part of this country from the very beginning. I'd like to wrap up by saying that we are, as in the state of regeneration. There's a lot of information out there in spiritist literature about the regeneration of the planet. I would just like to end by saying, I think that the way America was set up helped along that process along. It doesn't mean it's been practiced fully or well at times. There are times when it's not gone well at all. But the idea of the, the foundation of this country, the premise of this country, from as a way of moving away from the way the world operated before, in which the world was largely autocratic, did not necessarily encourage intellectual freedom and, or necessarily individual spiritual progress and so forth. Uh, if we have a, a more in-depth understanding of what it really means to have freedom and we appreciate the responsibilities that come with that and we understand that democracy takes a lot of ongoing effort. Democracy is not on autopilot. If we take democracy for granted, then it will be under threat. And not taking it for granted means that we have to be involved in whatever way we can, but we also need to take individual responsibility. So if we really wanna do our part, we can uh, certainly work on our own intellectual and spiritual progress again, balancing intellectual and moral progress, and that can have a reverberating effect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, can you- um, Stop slide? sharing. Yes, mm -hmm. please. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So to me, this was very interesting, kind of got lost a little bit, but you know, I wrapped up in my own stuff, but okay. I, I'm going to sit and listen to hear what others have to say. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Peter, outstanding. My goodness. Um, so many different ways to go with this, but for a person who's been around for a while, I, I can easily see the transition. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, I was just telling my sons this. I, I said, you know, within the last year with what has happened in, in Ukraine, the media has picked up on this potential for atomic war. Mm -hmm. 
how, how does your generation react to that? Right over their heads. And I said, um, and, and I said to them, mm, and I said to them, well, mm. I want to share something with you. When I was nine years old, the Red Scare was every day. Mm -hmm. We were inundated with every day. And you know what they told us? Crawl under your desk. Hmm. And so regardless of my spiritual beliefs and what I truly believe that the evolution of this country is, humans are now back into this mode of 1960 with a red fear. Mm -hmm. isn't, isn't that interesting? And it's not just Russia, of course, it's you know, world fear. And you know, he said, well, isn't the cancel culture a result of that? Now, this is a perspective that the new generation has that I didn't have, this discrediting of oddball ideas. Mm. And yet we're a country that's founded on the freedom to have oddball ideas. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. What an amazing, what an amazing presentation. Thank you for the consciousness. Yeah. Fascinating, fascinating. I love history. And I have been recently in Washington, D.C. and Thomas Jefferson Hotel. <laughs> and it's a lot, you have a, a library inside the hotel with old books by that time of the constitution. I took some pictures, I, I can share with you some later. It is amazing, oh, the work he did as a father of this nation. A mm -hmm. And I believe in the book, uh, Brazil, uh, Heart of the World, uh, Brazil, Coração do Mundo, Pátria do Evangelho. And uh, I, I have a chapter about America. I don't know if you have read because we do not have a translation yet in English. Yeah, I haven't. But mm -hmm. Yeah, but ask your wife to, to try to have a part there. Uh, the importance of uh, Americas, the South America, the Central America, and the North America in the planet. Mm -hmm. okay. You can see with the new plan uh, the new countries uh, in, in the planet Earth, planet by Jesus Christ. And it's so beautiful. And that is not... Um, in van that they call Thomas Jefferson the father of the nation. Uh, if I'm not wrong, I may be mistaken here. I believe that Thomas Jefferson's spirit is the mentor of United States. Oh, like like Isma, Ismael is the mentor of Brazil, and uh, the uh, Louis fifteen is the spiritual mentor of France. <laughs> And Isabel, the Queen Isabel is the mentor, a spiritual mentor of Portugal, and so on and so on. <laughs> so thank you so very much. I love it. And I want to review again. It's, a, it's amazing. Thanks so very much for your thank time. You. Yeah, th thank you very much, Peter. This is Dave Murphy. That's an amazing connection that you draw between the past and the um, the progress we're making now, and um, it's very special how you've shown spirit part. This is wonderful. Come back anytime. We'd love to have you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Again, it's a very difficult to do something like this in a short period of time. So, like you could. Break you've this done an up excellent. Yourself, but you know. Mm -hmm. Tanya, did you say that? Chico was one of the, the, also one of the spirits who's helping to change the energy or the vibration to bring up our consciousness in this. Uh, did you say that? Today? Yeah. No, no, I said, <laughs> I said she, Chico, if I'm not mistaken, Chico was talking about the spiritual mentors of nations. And oh. who was mm -hmm. whom? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. I guess the gist of your talk is we have a lot more work to do morally. Yes, yes. <laughs> but Thanks. it's not like we have have not made any progress at all. That's right, yes, thankfully. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here. Thank you. Well, Peter, I appreciate the history lesson. It's amazing. Uh, I, I believe that your 
uh, interest in putting a presentation together, combining the concepts of spiritism and the history, political, social, that kind of stuff is, it's a challenge. I mean, I haven't seen that before, but I appreciate your effort to do that. And the one thing that uh, I want to highlight about the presentation is when you question uh, uh, the question about uh, if uh, the nation is an individual. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I, according to spiritism, uh, nations are just like a collective awareness. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. so it's a collective awareness that uh, is implemented. And, uh, and what's interesting to me is just the aspect that uh, uh, it is important for us to understand that uh, as like individuals, nations, other countries, uh, planets, they all have that same evolutionary process to go through in order to reach higher levels. So I guess uh, the United States, just like any other country, is in the same path. Mm -hmm. We have advanced ones, we have less advanced ones. However, we are all moving that direction. And, uh, and the thing is that uh, I think we need to look at this process not as, uh, well, this is uh, what uh, one country is doing, but more so what we are doing as citizens of the planet. Yes. As citizens of the planet, because there's a lot of cross boundaries and that's about um, a mindset mm -hmm. um, that determines a lot of uh, the roles that uh, these, these countries play. For example, if uh, we are considering to be, uh, well, one, one thing that came to a lot of discussion recently was the concept of uh, ideology of uh, white supremacy. So mm -hmm. that's something that is cross country, it's everywhere. It's not just one location mm -hmm. or uh, the mindset of people that are more interested in money and uh, being superior than the poor or retaining. I had one professor at uh, when I was going to my first year in college that I could not understand what he said. He mm -hmm. was not Brazilian. He was uh, from somewhere in Europe. And he said that there's a natural process that's going on that once you pull a blanket to one side, the other side will be uncovered. Okay. So it took me a while for me to understand that. But uh, when you think about that, for example, uh, countries like United States uh, with whole authority has the right to claim that, okay, we have this uh, uh, intellectual advancement or technological advancement. However, when you bring all the intelligence from other places and you attract them to one side, so that creates this uh, false impression that we are superior than the others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's something that we all have to consider. But I appreciate uh, you bringing this up because there's a lot of food for thought. And uh, I'm interested in that understanding. And uh, thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything they want to say? Well, one more thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, wow. yeah, one point that I uh, I remember that in the beginning of the Spiritism, when the books of Alan Kardec were presented to the world in many capacities, uh, there was a movement here in the United States that rejected that ideology, that uh, kept that knowledge away, because at that time when Spiritism was uh, United States had the opportunity to embrace the spiritism, uh, it was rejected because the, the prevalent ideology at that time was saying, look, we don't want to hear anything that tells me that if I'm a slave owner and uh, I'm going to be reincarnated as a slave in the future, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So that's uh, something that we, we ought to consider. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of things in the beginning of this country's creation that it just simply wasn't ready for. You know, people were not willing. There was a lot of resistance. 
sometimes ideas that get introduced will then take a while, decades perhaps, right. to finally come to fruition. Yeah, but it, it's a lot interesting, this debate, because we help us think about, okay, what's our role? What are we doing here? And what's the intent that we want to pursue? Yeah. Yeah. Peter, any comments on how the environment being protected, um, our, our spiritism could align to bring that concern to the forefront more? Because it looks like we're just doing a great job of gobbling up and polluting to um, have a better style across the board from very, very affluent people to folks that are just barely getting by. Well, that's you one of those areas where, you know, the imbalance between intellectual and moral progress is pronounced. It's not that we don't have any idea what to do. There's, you know, been a lot of talk, not just talk, but efforts to develop a sustainable economy. Now, there may be some very real logistical difficulties in getting off of fossil fuels, but I think a more important question is, is there the collective will to do so? Because if there's a big effort to hang on to the good old days and and for a, a system that benefits you know those who are very powerful then it depends on how much of a resistance there really is um, will the next generation coming in go we have to do something about this and we're going to do something right now or um if indeed, you know, hurricanes and other natural disasters are definitely a result of global warming, do we have to get through even more destruction than what we just went through in the last few days before people start to say, you know what, maybe the cost of this is just not worth it. It's a fortunate to think that we might have to go through a lot of destruction like that before people finally start to change. Um, there, there may also be the cynical approach, which is how can we profit from disaster? You know, that approach. But putting that aside for a moment, uh, I do think, generally speaking, it's, it is an example where moral progress does need to develop because if we realize that the stewardship of this planet is important and that we can't act like there's no tomorrow, then that can be those kinds of seismic shifts within ourselves collectively that might help. And will that happen? I certainly hope so, um, but it remains to be seen. Um, it's possible that things will get worse before they get better. There is one concept that is out there is the one that said, change the world one mind at a time. Yeah. Right. And that's where the spiritism yeah. comes in and right. uh, reinforces mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I think so, because going out and saying we must stop doing this, you know, is not going to work. I mean, yeah, you cannot decree that. If, if any of you have succeeded at converting someone else to think the way you would like them to think, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> yeah, that, that is why uh, the constantly uh, focus and insistently talking about inner transformation, yes. because more uh, people is aware uh, of, of them, their, their well-being, uh, who they are, where they come from, and we are where we are going from here, and 